pet nation in America. Wow. And uh, Mark Cushing, he he wrote the book, and he is the CEO and founder of the Animal Animal. What is it? Animal Rights Animal, animal Policy Group. Policy group, Animal much Policy. More important, group. Much more important. And uh, he joins us. Where are you? You're in the East Coast, Mark. No, I I live uh, near Scottsdale in Arizona. Okay, better, much better, my friend. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We want to talk to you about the animal rights group, or rather animal policy group. And uh, we want to talk about what you're doing and what's in your book. And we want to talk about the relationship, the bond between animals and people, especially in the time of COVID and the time of families that disappear to the far, far corners of the earth. So first, um, I'd like to just tell you that I learned early that the remarkable thing about dogs is that they were our first friends. Uh, am I right? You know, they, they, they didn't get to live in the caves with us for no reason. They got to live in the caves with us because they had certain characteristics that, uh, that made us want to have them there. Um, you're familiar with that? Can you talk about it? Well, I, I, yes. I mean, that is uh, the original experience of what we call the human-animal bond, which, believe it or not now, the Purdue University College of Veterinary Medicine Library has 32,000 entries relating to research and discussion of the human-animal bond. And, and it's actually the secret sauce that explains as far back in culture as you want to go why people and dogs or cats or other pets uh, get along the way they do because your oxytocin level goes up. That's the source of happiness and calm and joy. And your cortisol level goes down, which is anxiety and stress. And that's a physical chemical uh, process in the brain tied to engagement with pets. It's been studied and restudied and, and confirmed. And so it's not surprising going as far back as you go. But the truth is for a hell of a long time, dogs became laborers and hunters and, and there weren't they weren't just having fun around the campfire, but they were given a chance to roam and live more of a dog's life as we used to know it. Cats had a rough time. They were basically sanitation workers to kill mice and rats. That was their job. And they were on ships coming to the U.S. originally to do that job. And they did that job, uh, Jay, in the cities in the East Coast and the Midwest for nearly 100 years. They were basically the sanitation workers. Then one day, public health arrived, as we know it, and they were fired and insult to injury, they were mass euthanized to the tune of millions of cats a year. So I call cats the comeback kids. I mean, they went from that to having, you know, 90 million pet cats in America treated as royally as dogs are treated. You know, and it's, it's, it's a good story. It's, it's, an, it's a funny story, uh, unless you were a cat back in the day, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. So I was telling you before the show that there's an ad um, on cable TV all across the channels involving a, a fellow who's trying to sell car insurance and uh, and an ostrich. And uh, when, whenever I see this ostrich, it's is personal, but I've been meaning to ask somebody who knows about this, so you're the one. Whenever I see this ostrich, I love this ostrich. Uh -huh. And um, sometimes the ostrich is wearing sunglasses, you know, decked out in some kind of outfit. But I always have a physical reaction. I mean, it's physical. I can feel my body reacting. And I'm saying to myself, this has something to do with what we're talking about. The bond between animals and humans existed a long time. And it's, it's physical. It's deep in our DNA, don't you think? No, it is. And it's... It's, you know, academic researchers, it's not just like your grandmother's flu remedy that you wonder, is there really any science to this? There's an actual science, Shay, behind it. And, and, and that's what you're experiencing. And it's when that oxytocin level goes up, it puts you in a mood to laugh, to smile. You know, you, you're, you're receptive to the idea. And so uh, here's the best example. One of the real triggers to this whole pet nation, this whole cultural change in the U.S., was when Subaru and Nissan, about 20, 25 years ago, and I still can't imagine the CEO of those companies going along with this, but they, they ran the ads that they were gonna run for the next year, you know, millions and millions of dollars, right? And what were the ads? A retriever in the passenger seat with the window down in a car along the California coastal highway and the retriever smiling. 
and not a word was mentioned about the car, its performance, any feature of the car. And I've got to believe the CEO said, so, so where's the ad? What are we doing here? And the agency, brilliant, said, um, actually, we just want them to see a dog and associate it with our brand. That's all we're doing here. Don't, don't, get, don't get complicated and don't overthink it. And I, I mean, I think it took such courage to say, okay, you tell me this is what people want to do. Well, you flash forward two years ago, I remember the Hyundai ads at, at, over the Christmas holidays. Um, and they had five Hyundais, silver, from tallest to smallest. And in front of them were five dogs, tallest to smallest. And they didn't care if you looked at one car, right? They wanted you to do one thing, see the dog, go, hey, that looks like, and connect it to the, to the Hyundai brand. And that was it. And that's you looking at the ostrich going, I don't know what they're selling, but I'll buy it. That's, it looks like, you know, there's something about this that makes me trust it and, and enjoy it. So well, here we are. And, and you talk about this in a dynamic fashion. What I, what I get is that this process, this phenomenon of the connection of the individual and the, and the pet animals, or maybe animals in general, is increasing with the complexity of our society. Am I right? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's surging. It, it began in the childhood of baby boomers. And any baby boomer watching will remember on Sunday nights what you did. You, you made sure you watched Lassie, the greatest dog ever. Now, my, my pappy on puppy heard that, and it's not true, Louie, of course, you know. Um, <laughs> and, and here's the amazing thing. The, the author, the original author of the story that created the dog named Lassie was a friend of Charles Dickens. Okay, well, Charles Dickens wasn't around in the 50s and 60s and 70s, let me assure you. You know, he was a, back in the 1800s. But that dog, what did it do? It showed people dogs can be loyal, they're your friend, they're courageous, they're brave, they like to hang out with you, they'll do anything you want, they'll sleep on your bed next to you, whatever you want. And it began, and then you, you had old Yeller, you had Ren Ten Ten. And then you had Scooby-Doo cartoon dogs. And suddenly we had animals, but mainly pets, cats and dogs everywhere. And they were fun. They, they, they were useful. You wanted to have them. And they, what that led to was they came inside. So dogs and cats particularly that mainly lived outdoors and in a climate like Hawaii or where we live here in Scottsdale uh, in Arizona, you could see you know, most of the year that was possible, but they came inside. And people began to spend more time with them. And that's when that human-animal bond was triggered. People just noticed they felt better. They liked it. And, and then dog owners decided, well, that's not good enough. I'm just going to figuratively take our dog out the front door into America. And that's what happened over the last 20 years. Dogs went places we never could have imagined, places that, that said no dogs allowed. And suddenly hotels, hospitals, my favorite example. 25 years ago, if you saw a dog in a hospital, there'd be a nurse or an orderly chasing that dog down the hallway and out the door. You can't find a hospital that doesn't have an animal-assisted therapy dog today where the dogs are part of the therapy and treatment uh, of the patients. And, and that's accepted as good medicine and good science. And it's uh, lots of examples like that. In 1988, Mark, uh, my wife and I went to France <clears throat> and uh, I'll never forget this. And we, we went to a, a place in the uh, Loire Valley. It's called the uh, the, the uh, Inn of the 12th Century, Albert's uh, Deuxième Siècle. And um, and we noticed in the in the in the inn in the restaurant there, everybody had a dog yeah. sitting on under the table on their feet. I had not seen that in the U.S. in 1988. Um, and realized that the French really had a, a, an edge on us that way, and that there was really no hygienic reason not to have the dog. I mean, you're not going to have a dirty dog, but um, you know, pet animal, you're, you're part of your family. And I think that's catching on. Do you know that that's catching on in the U.S.? Well, first of all, there, there was always a joke that, you know, the French treated dogs better than kids. I mean, you, you, could, have a, <laughs> you, you, know, you could have a dog in a park, but you go to Paris with a child, and it's like, get the, excuse me, you know, no, no, no children allowed. <laughs> it was interesting in France, they didn't take it much further than restaurants. What was unique to France was just this, that you would see a dog inside of a restaurant. In, in the US, virtually all restaurants 
allow dogs only on the terraces, like in Hawaii or, or here in Arizona outdoors. They don't allow them inside. It's it's that has not really caught on the way you would think it would, where dogs are otherwise everywhere in the U.S. So France hasn't stayed as vigilant, if you will, and people haven't pushed the boundaries there the way they have here. And, mm -hmm. and that part of the story in my book, chapter three is what I call the pet land grab. You know, the whole damn countries run amok. You know, just the fact that dogs are literally everywhere. Yeah, <clears throat> let's talk about your book for a minute. Why did you write it? Well, I, I was uh, approached by an agent and she knew that uh, some major publishers and we, we ended up being published by Penguin Random House uh, were really interested and intrigued by get the inside story of how this all happened. How do we go from where we were with pets to where they're now a centerpiece of families? They're, 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 they sleep on top of the bed with pet owners. They're not only not outside, they're not on their little bed next to the bed. They're, they're you know, right on the bed. And basically the culture flipped upside down about pets. The economy of pets grew at a staggering pace. The number of pets grew at a staggering pace, outstripping the growth of population in the US. So they wanted, and I'd been thinking about a, a lot of the topics. I've been involved in the industry, Jay, for about 15 years, but I can't say, I wasn't thinking of writing a book, uh, but talk with an agent I was introduced to. And I, I thought about it and I gave her an outline which was pretty much the book as, as I wrote it. And the publisher looked at the outline and said, yeah, that's the story we want told. Um, with a lot of data, a lot of you know, facts and figures to, to just give people things to think about. Um, and that, so I wrote it in 2018 and 19, basically. Um, what do you want them to think about? What's the takeaway? Well, one of them will surprise you. I don't think we have enough pets. Um, why do I say that? Because of the human animal bond, because of how powerful a force that is, in a positive manner in people's lives. And then the, the companion of that, which is the social capital of pets, there were studies done in Perth, in Western Australia, San Diego, Portland, Oregon, and Nashville. And they, they, they were blind studies of what, what makes a community and a neighborhood work. Trust goes up, fear goes down, people meet their neighbors, they're not as isolated. Just what's the glue? Churches, religion, you know, school, sports, music, culture, politics, whatever you want to say, it was pets. In each of those cities, it came back pets. And so, you know, my view is we could have more pets. We shouldn't require people to have a pet, but barriers to have a pets, apartments that don't let you have pets, which I'm sure you have in Hawaii, like we have in the mainland. Sure. Um, th those should be, those barriers should come down. I mean, basically I, I call pets the cheapest medicine in the United States to make people healthier, happier, and make communities work better. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, it helps bond the family. It helps, um, you know, do recreation, get you out of your house. It, mm -hmm. it, helps, um, it, it helps you love, and it gives you love. Uh, those things are not easy to achieve without a pet, actually. So uh, can you read us a, a paragraph you think would be emblematic of... Um, <laughs> the kind of prose, the kind of message you want to send with this book? Well, I'll pick any I, paragraph. I'll it's tell you what. I'll, I'll tell on a donkey. I'll, 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 I'm going to read the first paragraph because it kind of tells it. Or I could go to the last chapter where I spend three pages arguing with the Pope, Pope Francis I. We should, I'll, we should talk about that later, but I'll read the first paragraph. Okay. <laughs> and the book's available on audio too, by the way, if people, if people like to listen to a book. Um, but it's, in, it's on Amazon. I can find yeah, it on Amazon. Yeah. And Barnes and Noble and all those. Okay. Two strangers meet in a park, each walking with a dog on a leash. They don't ask each other where they work or live or went to college or about the kind of car they drive or their favorite football team. They say one, perhaps two things. What kind of dog is that? What's her name? 20 minutes later, they know everything about each other's pet and then part ways as friends. Not have each other over to dinner friends, but friends who look forward to seeing each other and their dogs again. Oh, that's, that's so true. And, and that's really the essence of, of this. And it's, it's true in small town America, small town Hawaii, in the middle of Honolulu, in the middle of Manhattan. You know, you can walk down a street, you can walk down Fifth Avenue and have six Afghans that look like horses with a handler behind them 
coming right at you. And it's in 10 years ago, you would have motioned to a policeman and said, Hey, can we, can we get these dogs off the sidewalk? And now it's like, you go out in the street, you tiptoe around them. But in truth, everybody's smiling, you know, everybody's enjoying it. And that's, that's been the secret of the uh, emergence of dogs and, and arrival of dogs in public places you'd never imagine. Because in truth, 70% of the people around those dogs thought, hey, that's fun. I'm going to bring my dog here. You know, I know how, how cool that is. So, Indeed. So uh, the uh, animal um, policy, policy group. group. Correct. What kind of policies are we talking about? Is this a nonprofit? Um, no, no, I, I can say that it's aggressively a for-profit. Um, okay. I get asked that a lot. No, I, I'm really fortunate. I have a team of nine that are uh, in all different time zones of the U.S. that work with me. And we represent uh, the, the biggest players in the pet space, veterinary, pharmaceutical, food, PetSmart, the retailer, veterinary colleges, many, many other groups connected to pets. And the states, including Hawaii, pretty aggressively in Hawaii, we could talk about that. Uh, the states regulate veterinarians and they regulate pets and animal welfare, not the federal government. The federal government rep, you know, regulates cows and pigs and chickens and food animals, mm -hmm. but not pets. So we handle for people all the issues and, and companies mainly, I should say, all the issues that come up regarding pets. Um, I also do a lot of work getting veterinary schools started and accredited. And then I've created a number of industry associations like the Veterinary Virtual Care Association, which promotes telemedicine now in the veterinary space and, and other, other organizations. So um, I tell people I'm mainly hired to change things because it was a sleepy industry, kind of a sideshow you know, to America 25 years ago. And then things changed. And, and particularly as millennials showed up and Gen Zs, they now own 60% of the pets. And they're front and center in their lives. And they want the same thing for their pets, healthcare, nutrition, you name it, that, that they have for themselves. And the pet world really wasn't ready for that. So you had a lot of barriers to pet ownership. And my clients wanted to see more pets and, and thought it was a good thing and, and also a good business. So um, they, would laugh, they would laugh and say, Jay, don't, don't let Mark tell you he's a nonprofit. Uh, you know, we, uh, we get a, we <laughs> it's, get a, it's a great idea. It's a win, win, win. Uh, well, I hope so. It, I've been, uh, I got in accidentally really in 2005 and six when I was a lobbyist and lawyer in Washington, DC. And I solved a problem for the industry in Congress. And I figured that was it. I enjoyed it. You know, I, I'd go off and do my other work that I was involved in. And then the phone started ringing, honestly, and the, the coalition that was involved represented the industry to my great good luck. And they, you know, foolishly concluded I knew what I was doing and I, 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 I could get something done for them. So it led to uh, a year or two and then suddenly I was doing nothing but pets, which my kids forever kid me about. They, 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 they never saw that coming and uh, it's, it's been fun. And it's, it's, it's accompanied this whole, 15 year stretch where pets became so important and so prominent and then COVID hit and it's been like steroids um, since March of 2020 in terms of all the issues. We, we don't have enough dogs. People I'm sure watch TV ads and think that can't be true or we can talk about that. We, we have a serious shortage of veterinarians in the country. You now have big cities in the mainland where it's a two day wait to get into an emergency clinic. So imagine having your dog hit by a car in Los Angeles and literally not being able to get a veterinarian to see your dog for two days. And, and sadly, there've been deaths. And I've, I've been doing interviews with, with affiliates in San Francisco and LA because they had friends in that predicament, the producers did. Um, and uh, so there, there's a downside, you know, not everything's happy and perfect with the world of pets, as much fun as we have with them. Sure, well, before I, I um ask you more about that. I want to ask about the reference you made to the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lest, you know, lest we forget the Pope. Uh, what, what was that reference? Okay. And this, my, my mother, a devout Irish Catholic, is, she passed away a few years ago. And 
she knew I had this viewpoint before she passed away. And she had a Time magazine cover of Pope Francis I on her coffee table in her assisted living in Portland, Oregon. And, and I mean, I know right now she's listening. She's like, Jay, don't let him tell you this story. Just, just ask him something else. But I'm going to do it because it's, it's a fun story. So let's start with this. Every pope um, takes a name for themselves. So if, if you became Pope, you wouldn't be Pope Jay. You'd, you'd pick a name of a saint and that would become your name. Well, he picked Francis the first and he specifically picked Francis, St. Francis of Assisi. Well, everybody know, you don't have to be Catholic to know that's the patron saint of animals. There are St. Francis of Assisi churches all over America. I can picture one in Manhattan and one in Santa Fe that stand out for me. And he's covered with, he's got snakes on his head and birds and dogs and squirrels. And, you know, there's, there's 20 animals. And it's, it's like the staff person for the Pope forgot to tell him this because here's what he did. He gave an interview to a journalist from Argentina and he's from Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. And he criticized the culture of pets. And I think he was thinking mainly about America. And he was very critical of the money and emotional time that people spend on pets. And he had this theory, it's called, and you know, you're familiar with this, the zero sum theory. His theory was this, if you love a dog and you love your cat, it takes away and you're not able to love and be kind and compassionate to people. It's like, it's one or the other, it's a choice. And it's, it's frankly absurd. No I would argue, yeah, I would agree. And, and in fact, for, there's two things about that. There's no evidence that people that own pets are less generous, giving money, donating time, doing things for, for people, right? And there's great evidence that pets bring the best out in people, that, that they take, in many cases, extreme introverts that, that have a hard time even being social. And because people want to talk about their pet, it makes them comfortable. Well, then he went further. So I, I did a blog about that uh, back in 2015 and, and had some fun. My mom, you know, uh, she was still alive and didn't want to hear about it. She was like, don't, don't, don't I want to hear about your, your, your pet theory here, Mark. My mom, by the way, wasn't really a big fan of pets. Flash forward, he didn't stop. Then he began to give sermons saying, woe be the couple that go their lifetime together as married couple and don't have children and only have pets. And you're going to be let down. It's going to be a lonely end for you. And I thought to myself, well, first of all, a lot of people don't have kids. I happen to have five kids, but a lot of people have kids. And that's a little churlish right off the bat. But to say that, that having pets leads to, you know, that lonely last decade or last year, whatever, um, no. Again, sorry, Pope, no evidence of that. It actually seems counterintuitive to, uh, to most people. So I had, I had a client who was well into her 90s and her pets kept her alive. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the day after her, her last dog died, she died. You know what? It wouldn't surprise me. There are, there's now a, a wonderful nonprofit I'm on the board of called Pets Peace of Mind. I'm not sure if it's active in Hawaii. It should be. I'll, because we're talking, I'll make sure it is. And they work with human hospices, you know, where people go that are at a stage often of cancer where they know that they have, you know, a month or two months or maybe six months, but there's no realistic hope of, of survival. And they arrange to have their pet brought in and they're, they arrange to have the pet adopted when the pet parent passes away or the owner passes away, right? And the staff are trained not to get upset about a pet in a room. Well, the truth is they have fun too. And the quality of life for that last month or two, you can imagine, you know, I mean, a brand, the first video I saw, I was in a room of industry executives. There was not a dry eye in the house because they showed people and they showed people with their dog and what it meant to them. And you know what? They went out of the world in peace and, and, and calm and, and, and content. And they didn't worry about their dog. They knew that their dog had a home to go to. Um, so I think the, the Pope needs a corgi or something. He needs to get down on the rug, <laughs> one of those $100,000 Renaissance rugs he has in his Vatican chambers. And, and I think he'd have a different, uh, he'd have a different take, but it, I have some fun with that. And uh, like well, I said, it's a great story. My let, mom, me, let me, let me yeah. flip this uh, over a little bit though, Mark. So you have a lot of people mm, adopting pets they, and they come from all places. They come from 
Um, they come from breeders who may not be humane. They come from uh, ASPCA and humane society organizations who, you know, may, you know, I don't know about humaneness, but they, that may not yield a perfect match, if you will. Um, and they, they take these pets thinking, as we have been discussing, you know, this is going to help them in their personal lives and give them love where may, maybe they don't have love. Um, but they're not capable of handling the pet. And the pet is not a good match for them. And, and thus, you know, that leads to abuse in some cases. And I'm, and I'm sure the animal policy group uh, would be concerned about that and try to protect them either through humane societies or ASPCA organizations or the like. But I, I guess as we develop more pets in our society, query, um, are we developing more abuse too? And by abuse, I, I also mean, you know, abandonment. Because um, that's very tragic. Well, and there are so many situations you hear about. Lots to, lots to comment on there. Very, very good point and, and, and appreciate your, your raising it. So I'll just give you some random responses to it, that different aspects of that. There really is not evidence of a significant increase in abused pets um, because of the increase in adoptions. Uh, there's a lot more vehicles and, and, and services available to teach people how to handle pets. And that, that was always part of the problem. People didn't know what to do and they get frustrated. The dog goes to the bathroom on the carpet and they want to take the dog back. There seems to be less of that. Um, I will tell you what there is though, and th this is very disturbing, but it shouldn't surprise people. There have been studies done, academic studies, uh, multiple ones that show many adult felons that, that are sexually and physically abused women started out abusing animals. It was almost like spring training or prep school that, that you, you, you would, and I remember as a kid, there was one guy down the street and he, he thought it was great to put a firecracker inside of a frog. Now, who, oh, who would, who would do that? You know, who would do that? Who would do that? But you know what? People did that. So, so what we've learned is that if you see a child mistreating a pet, get involved right away with that kid because there's more going on than just the sadness with that pet. But they, this may be in spring training for someone that, you know, when they're 18, 20, 25, are, are, are doing worse things than that. Um, it's interesting, the idea that pets get mismatched, there, there was a slogan used, and it's not used anymore, it's called adopt, don't shop. It was a moral argument that you have a duty to go to a shelter and get your pet rather than go to a breeder. You know what millennials have said? We'll get the pet we want. We're gonna study, we're gonna read about the pets, we're gonna think about our lifestyle and we're gonna figure out what we want that fits us. And if we go to a breeder, that's our decision, not the shelter. Now with COVID, turns out the shelters are pretty close to empty in most parts of America, not everywhere. I always have to point that out, but in most areas and most urban shelters are empty. So you don't have the choice anymore if you wanted it. Um, so, so it's a very dynamic situation, Jay, and it's not, it doesn't lend itself quite to the, an older fear. That argument, not, you didn't make an argument, but that theory about it was probably more true about 10 years ago. I think it's less the case today. On the, on the other side of that, um, you can really love a pet too much. Um, <laughs> I, I suspect that some people really become completely devoted, beyond devoted, but dependent. Uh, like I mentioned, this uh, you know 90-year-old woman, uh, her, her, her life was uh, dependent on her pet. Um, and, um, you know, okay, you wonder if there's a point out there. And then I add this, you know, there, there are people who have lots of money who say to themselves, I want to perpetuate this pet. I want, I want to take the DNA from this pet and I want to use uh, CRISPR or some kind of advanced technology and clone the pet. 
and I want him to look just like the previous pet. Um, I want him to act just, I want him to be a duplicate of the previous pet. Now that's troubling on a you know mor mor moral ethical basis, but I wonder what your thoughts are about that. I mean, maybe that's over the top. It, it, it sounds over the top. It's certainly not an industry yet. You're not seeing, in the, you know, I can tell you, you know, I, I live and breathe in the world of pets uh, and the business of pets, including every new way to make money involving pets, and that's not. It's not a visible trend, but I'm not surprised people do that. The truth is you take, there's a lot of designer breeds now that, that have oodle at the end, labradoodles, Australian, you know, cockapoos and so forth. You hear all, all sorts of things, right? The, 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 the back end of that is a poodle, right? And why do people like poodles? They don't shed. And breeders can turn out perfect labradoodles. And they do tend to look alike. So you wouldn't need to, to go to that length that you described. You can find a breeder that probably has a Labradoodle puppy that looks exactly like yours. But let me give you the, the shocking news. You know what the street price is today for a Labradoodle in the Western US? Thousands. $4,500. Wow. And, and, and that leads to a question that I, I, I deal with all the time, namely, do we run the risk of dogs becoming a luxury item as we have fewer dogs in shelters and, and we have breeding viewed so skeptically as inhumane and you know, not, a, not a legitimate occupation? So this will shock you. The CDC uh, came out in 2019 and said that we have close to a million 100,000 dogs coming in from foreign countries to this US to the US every year. And guess what? Less than 3% have any medical or vaccination or veterinary records. So they're not coming in the front door through customs. And somebody said to me, well, how could a dog get in here? And I said, well, how do you think drugs get into the US? Do you think the cartel checks them through TSA at the airport? No, <laughs> you know, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of wheat fields in the and there are a lot of, there's a lot of rangeland in the West, you know, in parts of Hawaii, not, not maybe as much in Hawaii. You can land a plane and get out of there at midnight, and nobody knows you were there, you know. So the point is, it, it's we're at a complicated stage where people want pets. Um, we have spayed and neutered to a fine art. The supply is reduced. Demand went up, and breeding is 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 a frowned upon, you know, in many minds, disreputable activity done behind 20 foot laurel hedges and no one really knows what goes on inside the, the breeding operation. And that's a collision in the future, but not the distant future. I, I work on that issue, Jay, almost daily, but every week I'm involved in, you know, how do we get past the current kind of roadblock we have in the, in the traffic jam about how we get pets? Because if you don't solve it, dogs do become a luxury item. You know, you, you can't make $50,000 a year and go spend 10% of your annual income on a Labradoodle. You know, that's, that's not a viable uh, choice for, for, for a family. And so we, we can't, we don't want to get in the, the situation that we're not in yet, but you can see that scenario unfolding if we don't come up with sources of dogs that are less expensive and accessible. Do you worry, Mark, about, um, you know, uh, this is a, a look into the future, a Charles, Dickin, Charles Dickens look into the future where we may have, um, when we have a decline in our economy, we may find that a certain percentage of the, the population of this country doesn't have a lot of money or has less money than it has now. And, um, uh, or, or we may find that weather or other disruptions separate people from their pets. And and their pets um, are out and about, uh, roaming wild. <laughs> more more pets out out and about than you know in the home, um, and more people in the home not willing or able to take care of them. And so you have you have wild pets. Uh, is that a possibility for the future of the country? I'm the last person to say anything is impossible in America's future right now. It's, it seems, <laughs> to, you know, you know, what was the Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times. Well, we yeah. certainly do. But, but I, I, 
I would say this, the, um, in 2015, so not, not the distant past, uh, a study was done I was involved in, and it was a national study. And it showed that people in America that, that had annual households that had annual incomes of $30,000 or less, which we would consider to be the poverty, poverty group, own dogs to the same percentage level as people that made $100,000 a year or more. So just six years ago, we were at a point where money didn't seem to divide dog owners one to the other. That's probably changing. So I, I think some specter of, of that future Dickensian uh, vision is possible. It's possible. The good news is we have a growing culture of volunteers as well as businesses wanting to provide services that are that are that can be affordable. You can own a pet, you can feed your pet, you can even get veterinary care on a modest income. So because there's so many and, and the industry's gotten more robust and it's using technology efficiently or more so than it used to, it, it, we probably have safeguards to that happening. But I'll tell you one thing, you have to, you know, it takes two dogs to make a puppy. All right. Let's just not surprise the audience. Okay. We don't we don't grow puppies in labs. Um, laboratories and well, aren't, lab, aren't, aren't uh, Labradors from laboratories? Yeah, there you go. Good, great. I was waiting. I was trying to tee that up for you. Good, very great response. <laughs> Here's the thing. Dogs are going to have to be bred somewhere in the world. And let me tell you about the, the million or so dogs that come in from foreign countries to the U.S. every year. Um, they come from some pretty rough neighborhoods. All right. They're not coming from Paris and Rome and Ottawa, Canada, and you know, uh, Sydney, Australia. I would just say pretty rough hoods. We have no clue how they're breeding dogs there, how they're training them, what kind of disease. And if they don't have medical records, you don't know what you're getting. I'm happy for those dogs, a million or so a year, they find a home in America, good. You know, and they hopefully make a family happy, but there are issues there and we aren't gonna be able to put off too long the, the sitting at the table, both sides, pro and con on breeders and figure out what are we going to do here, unless we're willing to see the price of dogs reach a point that the average American family can't afford them. Um, cats aren't in quite the same league, but by the way, there's even more and more pressure on demand for cats. We have two cats, my wife, Natalie, and I, and, and, and a puppy, and I think a lot of Americans are discovering you can't take them outside the way you take dogs outside. You know, cats, the old saying is dogs have owners and cats have staff. And, and I've, always thought that, I've always thought that that nails it. You know, a cat will look at you and say, pet me, and then they'll say, stop petting me. Come over here where I am, stop, don't come any further. You know, they, they, they go where they wanna go. And, and, and it's part of the joy of a cat is just seeing how condescending and, 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 and willful. And, and, and willful, that's right. But, uh, but they're fun. If you don't have a cat, you're missing, you're missing out on, on a very interesting uh, species and, and lots of fun too. Sure, and they can get along. But I want to make one comment, and I, I want to ask you one last question, because we're almost out of time, Mark. Um, the comment I make is uh, what I get out of a more complex society that we live in today, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere, is, um, you know, it's sort of a breakdown of mental health. And you see that National Association of, of Mental Illness is, has got more cases. There are, yeah. there are more problems in the community, you know, which which I would ascribe to, um, you know, the, the decline of mental health. And I think that's just a condition. That's the way it is. <clears throat> However, that also calls for pets because pets are therapeutic, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Nobody would argue. Um, and that we, we need pets for national, if not international, mental health. So they play an increasingly important role in a, an increasingly complex society. That's my view. I would imagine you hold the same view. I, I hold it, and I have, and, and you have a great deal of science and and social facts behind you. And I'm now part of a group that are going to be pushing Congress to do something that you may say you're kidding, but but it's right in line with what you're saying. The federal government in the U.S. subsidizes um, or directly funds 
all sorts of wellness behaviors, stopping drinking, stopping smoking, good nutrition, better exercise, right? Wellness activities, right? And we have all this data behind us showing that if you do that, you'll live longer and you won't need as much medical care and we'll all be better off. Well, the same can be applied to the ownership of pets and the care of pets. And I think we're at the point of saying to the government, you wanna, you wanna make an investment that makes Americans healthier, makes communities work better, help people have a pet, help people take care of a pet. 10 years ago, I got laughed out of a congressman's office who said, you're kidding. I mean, he says with a straight face, that's your argument. You know what he did next? He popped open his smartphone and said, but by the way, look at, look at my puppy, you see something. <laughs> and I said, bingo. I said, you know, you wait, what, now 10 years later, it, it, we're not laughed at with that argument. So you, you, make the, you can make the case that for people in need, the, the relatively low cost of owning a pet may be, like I could say, the best, cheapest medicine we can provide. So it's a great note to end, end the show on. I think it's, it's going to become a policy debate that we're in the middle of is, is to say, what can we do to make it easier for people to have a pet, not harder and less expensive? Yeah, and I want to end the show with something you, you said earlier because it really <clears throat> touched me. Is you don't want to have a designer pet. You don't want to sit around and agonize over what breed. Um, you want to look deeply in the eyes of this animal and find a connection. And uh, if you adopt a pet that you know may not be your favorite breed or your favorite you know, object of you know, uh, adoption, um, the, the pet will appreciate you all the more for it. It's a, it's a religious experience uh, for you to uh, adopt a, uh, a pet at the Humane Society, uh, a shelter dog. Uh, and in a, in a funny way, that's a, a richer experience than um, finding a Labradoodle. Labradoodle well, pets, pets seem to, to provide unconditional love. At least dogs do cats. I think they do. They just don't let you uh, get too cocky and, and, and take it for granted. But the truth is, it's, it's unconditional. And, and at the end of a rough day, um, you know, what's better than, you know, a, a dog in your lap or taking a walk or whatever you do with it. So uh, enjoy talking to you. I'm glad you, yeah. glad you shared an interest. And obviously, you're, you're, you're a pet lover and, and uh, uh, I wish you good luck. I am indeed. And I, I think that whatever love you give to a pet, you're going to get that back and more. Um, Mark, Mark Cushing, thank you so much, uh, Pet Nation. And uh, uh, one more flash on the book and uh, your website again. Uh, MarkLCushing.com for my author website and AnimalPolicyGroup.com is kind of a mouthful, but if you want to see what our business does. But uh, enjoy, I think if you get the book, you'll enjoy it. You'll learn a lot and you'll, you'll laugh and some good stories and, and, and it's all about pets. So uh, thanks for the chance. And, and uh, my wife and I hope to be in Hawaii sometime in the near future. You know, it's not as easy to travel these days, but uh, congratulations to you to have a great show in Hawaii. So appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Aloha. Thank you.